Ok. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, bienvenidos a la tercera edición de Kaggle Days Meetup en Madrid. Y bueno, tras el éxito de las dos anteriores, hoy hemos intentado preparar una agenda eh, para seguir manteniendo el listón bien alto. En primer lugar, eh, tendremos la intervención de Alberto Danese, eh, Kaggle Grand Master, que nos hablará de cómo funciona realmente Gradient Boosting. Después contaremos con Patricia Urbanek, que nos hablará sobre los eventos de Kaggle Days eh, a nivel mundial. Después tendremos una mesa redonda eh, sobre la competición de Microsoft Malware Prediction, que comentamos hace eh, dos eventos. Y eh, recordáis que dijimos que íbamos a dar un premio para que el que daba mejor en la competición. Y nos hemos encontrado con la grave sorpresa de que hemos tenido cuatro Kaglers españoles en, con medalla de oro en la competición. Estará José Vicente Mellado, Carlos Sevilla, Rodrigo Gómez, Juan Carlos eh, Galvez. Y también encontraremos con la eh, formidable presencia de Gilberto Titeris, eh, el Grand Master, con más de 45 medallas de oro. Eh, al final del, del evento tendremos, os retaremos otra vez, como en el último, a un quiz, a un concurso sobre preguntas de Machine Learning. Así que el que se atreva, que vaya descargándose la aplicación Kahoot en el móvil, porque luego la utilizaremos, ¿vale? Y, bu y bueno, no quería olvidarme de, de los sponsors, de Repsol, de Ayesa y de Término 7, porque gracias a ellos realmente este evento es posible. Bueno, pues sin más... Eh, eh, Vamos ahora a empezar entonces con, con Alberto. Alberto eh, es ingeniero informático por la Politécnica de Milán. Empezó trabajando como consultor, después fue manager en Ernst Young, después fue senior data scientist en Cervet y ahora es mm, director de data science en Nexi. Eh, Alberto ha participado en ocho competiciones en Kaggle, quedando seis veces medalla de oro, cuatro de ellas en solitario, bastante complicado, eh, otra vez plata y otra bronce. Eh, Alberto, aparte de ser eh, Kaggle Grandmaster, es también como nosotros eh, organizador de Kaggle Days Meetup en Milán. Y bueno, estamos deseando escucharlo eh, con su charla de cómo realmente funciona Gradient Boosting. Por favor, recibamos un aplauso a Alberto Danese. Well, I'm really delighted to be here in Madrid tonight for this uh, third Kaggle Days Meetup. Uh, my name is Alberto Danese, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, Javier, Fernando, and Virilo for inviting me in this uh, amazing venue that is uh, Google Campus for Startup. Um, my talk will be about gradient boosting and how it works, it, how it really works. Uh, and I would like to give you in uh, around 40 minutes uh, uh, enough information to be able to understand at least the basics uh, and be able to use uh, gradient boosting in a more, uh, let's say, conscious way. Um, I will just uh, tell you a few words about myself, even if uh, uh, Fernando already introduced me. Uh, I'm the head of data science of Nexi. Nexi uh, is a large Italian company. We are, uh, more or less uh, 2,000 people, uh, and uh, we are the leading company in digital payments. So we basically uh, issue uh, payment cards, credit cards, debit cards, uh, prepaid, and uh, we also work with merchants and with partner banks. Uh, and uh, before joining Nexi earlier this year, uh, I used to work in credit risk and in consultancy as well. Um, but well, probably is more interesting for you my Kaggle background. Uh, I joined Kaggle in 2016, and uh, well, uh, I achieved some decent results. And last year, I also won a prize in a masters-only competition uh, that is visible only to masters and grandmasters, actually. Um, so let's uh, let's go straight to to, to the point. Uh, gradient boosting in 2019. Um, Well, first of all, uh, when I was preparing the presentation, uh, I asked myself this simple question, that is, uh, does anyone care about gradient boosting in 2019? Because uh, if you work as a data scientist, you probably uh, hear a lot of, time, a lot of times uh, people speaking about uh, TensorFlow, about Keras, uh, deep learning frameworks, uh, deep learning ar architectures, uh, and so on. And, uh, 
it's not really uh, you know, as widespread, the, the idea of gradient boosting. Uh, and if you take a look at Google Trends, uh, that is a service from, from Google that uh, lets you compare the number of searches of different uh, terms, uh, you will see that uh, deep learning is uh, mm, you know, much more uh, widespread than uh, gradient boosting. Uh, it was this way also five years ago, but nowadays the difference is really, really huge. Uh, and well, my conclusion is that it seems that no one cares about gradient boosting, really. Uh, but I see there are so many of you here, so probably this is not the right conclusion. Uh, and well, actually, I care uh, about what top Keglers think about gradient boosting. And this is a survey that has been done uh, uh, in the first few months of this year that was targeted to the guys, that had, uh, guys and girls that had uh, at least uh, a top five finish in Kaggle uh, in the last three years. Uh, and uh, in, this, uh, in this survey, it was a very short survey, like 10 questions. One of, th of the questions was, uh, uh, what was your primary machine learning framework that you used uh, in order to achieve this result? And well, the first one was Keras, uh, that is uh, you know, a very versatile uh, uh, deep learning framework uh, that can be used for images, for videos, text, uh, and so on. But the second and the third one are LightGBM and XGBoost that are actually two implementations of gradient boosted trees. Um, so even if the field of application of gradient boosting is much more narrow, uh, because it can be used basically on tabular data, uh, it seems that uh, it's still a very important uh, uh, you know, approach uh, to, to machine learning competitions. And well, I will try to cover uh, in this short int introduction before you really dig into how, how uh, gradient boosting works, I will try to give you some basic information on three different perspectives. The data scientist perspective, the data engineer pers perspective, and the head of data science or business, per business uh, uh, point of view. So let me, let me just do a quick poll. How many of you are data scientists or call themselves data scientists? Please raise your hand. Okay, most of you. How many data engineers? Please raise your hand. It's just <laughs> less than 10 of you, okay? And uh, all the others that uh, you know have a business role or some other role? Okay, J just a few of you. So, okay, I'm lucky because I will focus mostly for, on the data science point of view of gradient boosting, but uh, um, I will give you also a few information on the other two. Um, well, when it comes to, to the data scientist point of view, uh, well, performance, first of all. Um, with gradient boosting, many Kaggle competitions have been won uh, using only gradient boosting implementations. Uh, I achieved the um, third place in a master's only competition, and it was only using gradient boosting uh, frameworks. Uh, and uh, even nowadays, uh, if you take a look at the competition on tabular data, you will see that uh, uh, most of them use an ensemble or some kind of stacking of uh, neural networks and uh, um, gradient boosting uh, frameworks, but uh, it's very difficult to find a tabular data competition that makes no use of, of gradient boosting at all. Uh, and if you take a look, for instance, to the largest competition so far, that is a Santander competition that uh, had, I think, 9,000 participants, more or less, uh, the winning performance has been achieved with a mix of gradient boosting and deep learning, uh, but there are some really nice kernels, uh, like uh, Gilberto's one, uh, that achieve a very, uh, very good ranking using only uh, like GBM, for instance, in just uh, 100 lines of code. So uh, as long as you are able to tune gradient boosting properly, you can achieve some great results uh, also with a single uh, uh, light GBM. And when it comes to, to versatility, uh, I think that for tabular data, uh, with gradient boosting, you can do basically whatever you want. You can do classification, uh, binary or multi-class, you can do regression, you can do ranking, uh, and you can customize objective function and evaluation metric uh, and I will talk about this uh, uh, a little bit later, but basically you can model any kind of problem on tabular data. Um, for instance, this is a screenshot from the, the documentation of uh, XGBoost. There are, I think, 13 built-in objective functions. Uh, and for instance, if you work in insurances, uh, you want to use a 2D regression that is very useful in, in that field, uh, you've got it already implemented. And I mean, you can find uh, uh, really a lot of uh, already built-in uh, objective functions, uh, uh, even if usually you're going to have a logistic regression uh, or a, bi a binary regression, um, uh, multi-class, and, and so on. Um, okay, um, let me just give you 
a quick uh, uh, some some information also from the data engineering point of view. Uh, well, LightGBM and XGBoost are of, of course the two most common implementation of gradient boosting. Uh, there is also CatBoost that is interesting, uh, made by Yandex, uh, but it's usually a little bit slower than the other two. Uh, and it, they are available for R and Python, so you can use basically whatever language you you like. And uh, the good thing is that no matter the implementation, they are very scalable. Uh, they are natively multi-threaded, even if uh, we, will see br we will see in a while that uh, gradient boosting is not natively a multi-threaded multi parallel approach to, to machine learning. And uh, they have GPU support, and they are also part of. Uh, they, are, they have also been implemented as part of the Spark frameworks uh, of MLlib or micro Microsoft Machine Learning for Apache Spark. So my main idea is that you can use uh, um, gradient boosting implementation both locally and on distributed environment uh, with CPUs or GPUs. So basically, in, in every possible scenario. And if you want to have a look at the cloud, there are many implementations. Uh, for instance, uh, on AWS SageMaker, on Google Cloud Platform, if you like uh, managed services, uh, or as well on, uh, on Microsoft Azure. So you can find basically implementation in any possible world, uh, on-premises, on cloud, uh, local or distributed. And well, I'll close this short introduction uh, with uh, the point of view of a head of data science or uh, the point of view of someone working also in the business. Um, the point is that you can really trust these kind of implementations because they have a long history. Uh, Adaboost is probably the first implementation of gradient boosting, uh, more or less as we know it, uh, and it was introduced in the 90s. Uh, and, uh, the current top implementations like XGBoost and LightGBM uh, are backed by large companies, by AWS and Google Cloud, or by Azure when it comes to, uh, to LightGBM. So, I mean, there is a lot of trust also on, on this approach. They are not just uh, uh, libraries used in uh, laboratories or on Kaggle competitions. Um, and they are also explainable, quite explainable. Uh, I did a talk about this topic uh, in Paris, in uh, Kaggle Days Paris, some of you uh, was there, uh, and uh, um, let me just say that you can enforce uh, constraints and you can explain uh, gradient boosted models uh, uh, both globally and locally. Uh, so you can add a good degree of explainability with Lime, uh, with Shapley, uh, and other way to explain predictions. So this, this, this short introduction was about uh, the reasons why gradient boosting is still very important, even in the you know, frenzy about uh, deep learning frameworks uh, and so on. Um, because I think that gradient boosting is still the, the go-to algorithm when it comes to working with tabular data. Uh, it's scalable. Uh, it can be used locally on-premises, on cloud. Uh, it has good interpretability, and it is very versatile. So it's, uh, um, let's say, uh, quite a complete algorithm for tabular data. And so I think it's worth to spend some time in understanding uh, how it works, uh, and especially how to do proper pre-processing, uh, feature engineering, and parameters tuning, uh, and in general, how to be quite effective and not losing time, wasting time on uh, useless optimizations uh, uh, or time-consuming operations. Um, so this is the reason why mm, I'm taking, having this talk today. Um, so, how gradient boosting really works? Um, first of all, let, let me just give you three terms that are important to, to have clear in mind. Uh, the first one is ensemble. Uh, we often use the term ensemble, and it is, uh, uh, let's say, any possible ways of putting together weak predictors in order to achieve a stronger predictor. Uh, no matter how you combine them, uh, the target is using weak predictors and achieve a better accuracy putting them together. Um, I can say that Ensemble user usually can be divided into two different approaches. One is called bagging, and the other one is boosting. Uh, bagging is what, uh, for instance, random forests do. So you have uh, uh, a lot of independent predictors, uh, weak predictors. Maybe they also overfit, uh, but they are completely independent one from the other. Uh, and so you can train as many as you want, and then you can just uh, average them. Uh, or do some kind of majority voting uh, in order to achieve the final prediction. Um, so it's a parallel approach, let's say. Uh, on the other hand, boosting is a completely different approach. It's a sequential approach, because uh, the different trees or whatever machine learning algorithm, whatever predictor, uh, are built one after the other on top of the previous uh, iteration. So it's a 
completely different approach because uh, every tree or every uh, predictor is an improvement of the previous one. Um, so they are, uh, as I said, completely different approaches. For instance, uh, bagging has not the problem of overfitting because they are all completely independent predictors, so you can train as many trees as you want and you will not incur in overfitting. You will reach a plateau sooner or later, but uh, you will not have uh, this kind of problem. While, for instance, boosting has a strong problem of overfitting, it, I will show you why in the next, uh, in the next few slides. This is another uh, interesting picture that just shows that uh, bagging is a parallel approach, and boosting, uh, basically, uh, as the name itself says, uh, boosts the, the previous prediction in order to achieve uh, uh, a better uh, uh, a better final result. Okay, so I was thinking how I, how I can uh, explain gradient boosting, and the first thing that I thought was uh, uh, to write down some formulas, some simple math to, to, explain, uh, to explain gradient boosting. And uh, I came up with something like this, um, that is to me a little bit intimidating. Uh, and, um, well, later I I spoke also to a professor that is in the audience uh, and that told me that it takes around 10 hours to explain gradient boosting properly. Uh, so I thought that, uh, okay, this was not for this kind of event and uh, maybe next time I will go with the math, with the, with the details, but I will not talk about uh, hard math today. Um, on the other end, I will follow a gradient boosting by example approach. So. Um, I will leave you some references. Uh, uh, there is this amazing uh, explained AI website that really has some sound and robust uh, mathematical uh, uh, explanations of gradient boosting. But uh, I will just uh, uh, use a simple example uh, to apply gradient boosting, really doing some kind of iteration, just uh, three iterations, uh, and uh, apply gradient, gradient boosting to a very simple problem that is uh, estimating the price of an apartment, the rental price of an apartment, uh, given the surface of the apartment itself. So I will not use uh, uh, really a large data set, but uh, just a five rows and two columns data set. Uh, you have the rental price that is the target that I, that I want to predict, uh, and the surface, the square feet, uh, that is my only feature. So it's a very simple example, but uh, uh, at least it makes it possible to perform manually gradient boosting in, a, in quite a short time. Okay, okay. Um, so first of all, um, I have a machine learning problem. I want to have uh, uh, a clear metric that I want to optimize. Uh, in this case, I, wish I, w I chose the mean square error, and obviously I want to minimize the mean square error at each iteration. Um, let me define three parameters, three important uh, uh, aspects that I want to measure. Uh, the first one is, I call it T, and it's the current estimation uh, that my machine learning algorithm has. Uh, so this is T, the current estimation. Uh, R are the residuals. Uh, so the residual is the, the difference of the actual target with respect to my current estimation, my current estimation T. And the E is the squared error uh, of a single record. Um, this is I use this kind of error, the squared error, because the metric that I want to use is the mean square error. Um, so I'll try to do gradient boosting by hand, uh, and I will try with the step zero. So uh, first of all, I will try to fit uh, my problem uh, with a trivial predictor. And the trivial predictor for uh, the mean square error is the mean of all the possible targets. Uh, so let's see how it, uh, how it looks like. Um, this is the starting uh, iteration, the iteration zero. Uh, I calculate T0, my current estimation, that is just the average of the, of the targets. Uh, then I calculate the residuals, that is the difference from the, the real target minus T0, minus the estimation. And in this way, I have the, the so-called residuals. And I can square them uh, in order to have E0, that is the, the error of, uh, of each record. And I can, uh, finally, I can calculate the mean uh, and the mean is 94,000, uh, so this is my error, my baseline error, my error at uh, T0. Let's do the first real iteration of gradient boosting. Um, in order to do this, I have to introduce a fourth variable that is F, and it is the fit of a binary tree to the residual of the previous iteration. Um, I will show you briefly. Um, so I'll just perform the step one. 
Um, so let's have a look at the right, uh, right, end, uh, right side of the, of the slide. Uh, first of all, I fit the residuals. Uh, you see F1, F1 if is the split, is the optimal split of a binary tree to, with respect to R0, because uh, the important thing in gradient boosting is that at each iteration, the problem changes, because the feature space is always the same. It's the surface. In this case, it's only one feature, but I could have uh, a thousand features. But the target is no longer the original target, but it's the residual of the previous, uh, of the previous iteration. So in this case, I fit F1, uh, I fit a binary tree and I achieve F1, that is the optimal split. Uh, and uh, uh, you see, in the column F1, you have the, the fit of a binary tree to, to the residuals are zero. And the idea of gradient boosting is that uh, the estimation at T1, at the first uh, real uh, iteration, is given by the mean that was the first uh, trivial predictor, plus F1, that is the fit uh, of the residuals. So we have T1 that is given by T0 plus F1. And again, in this way, I can calculate R1, that is the residual of the first iteration, uh, that is given by the, rental, the target, the original target, minus T1. Uh, so in this way, I calculate R1, the residuals at the first step, and I can square the, mm, these residuals in order to achieve, uh, again, the mean square error. And you can see that at the first iteration, the error was 94,000, uh, at iteration number zero, let's say. And at the first uh, at iteration number one, it becomes 9,000. So it's really dropping. And well, um, let me move uh, forward. Uh, I will not do all the math in this, uh, in this slide, but I will leave you the slides for, uh, for later. Um, the idea is that uh, at iteration number two, the problem changes again, and it, became, it has always the square feet as the, as the feature space. And R1, the residual set iteration one, are the new targets of, uh, of this operation. And so again, I fit uh, in the same fashion. I recalculate the residuals, and so on. And you can see that uh, the mean square error decreases at each uh, iteration. Uh, it went from 94,000 to 9,000 to 4 and to 3,000. And it's, uh, it's going to decrease by design at every step. Um, so it's really, it keeps on decreasing. Um, and I think that uh, uh, if you are careful, you will understand why it keeps on decreasing. Uh, because uh, I'm evaluating the mean square error in sample. So I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm definitely overfitting. Uh, and this is the first important result of this uh, short explanation. It's that uh, uh, if I keep on measuring the mean square error in sample, uh, by design, at every step, I will have a lower mean square error. Uh, that's why when we train uh, gradient-boosted trees, we have to use a cross-validation or a fixed uh, train, train and validation split uh, because we have to evaluate the, the mean square error, in this case, uh, on a holdout data set. Uh, in this way, we will not overfit and we, we will reach uh, an optimum uh, number of uh, trees uh, where the training error keeps on decreasing, but the validation error starts increasing. Uh, so this is the, idea, the first important result of this uh, um, let's say, of this short, uh, short example. Um, the second point is also very, very important. It's that uh, uh, in the example, I fit a simple uh, mean square error. Uh, but the point is that if I, not fi if I do not fit the residuals, but I fit the so-called pseudo-residuals, let's say, for simplicity, like a function of the residuals, um, I can optimize different metrics. Because maybe I don't want to optimize the mean square error, but I want to optimize the mean average error. And, uh, uh, the example that I did before will change a, li a little bit, but the approach more or less is the same. I will calculate the residuals and some kind of functions of the residuals. So the idea is that uh, basically I can optimize any metric as long as it's differentiable, but we will talk about it a little bit later, uh, just by you know, working on the residuals, not fitting the residuals directly. Um, and the third important point was something that actually I didn't un really understood uh, at first when I started doing Kaggle a few years ago. Uh, it's that we usually talk of gradient-boosted trees, but we really have uh, two different phases. One is the gradient-boosting phase, and one is the fitting of a weak predictor that usually are trees. But if you take a look at the documentation of XGBoost, for instance, you, can have, you have also a GB linear mode that is gradient-boosted linear regression, because uh, I'm not forced to use trees as weak predictors. Uh, as long as I compute the residuals, I, I could use any possible predictor, any possible machine learning algorithm. Um, 
So this is very important because uh, uh, we will see it later, but some of the parameters uh, uh, of XGBoost and LightGBM are related to the gradient boosting process, while some others are related to the way a single tree is built. Um, so it's very important to keep these uh, two things separate, the boosting process and the tree building. So I'll make one step forward, uh, and I will talk about some of the key concepts and, uh, and parameters of, uh, uh, of gradient boosting. Um, well, I will focus mostly here on gradient boosted trees, uh, even if, uh, as I told you, it's not the only, the only possibility that I have. Um, and one of the most, uh, I think, uh, usually misunderstood things about gradient boosting is the fact that we have uh, uh, two different metrics. One is the objective function, and one other is the evaluation metric. Uh, that are, I mean, uh, they are not the same thing, actually. Uh, they can be the same thing, but not necessarily. Um, they are implemented, obviously, in uh, a light GBM and XGBoost. Uh, and I will show you what these two, uh, let's say, aspects uh, really mean. Uh, the first one is the objective function. The objective function is uh, uh, how the residuals are fit, how the gradient boosting is actually performed. So I'm referring to the way of the function of the residuals are, are fit. Um, so this, this is what the algorithm is directly optimizing. Um, this, uh, what the algorithm is directly optimizing has to be a function, and this function has to be differentiable uh, in the native implementation, the original implementation of gradient boosting. Uh, Actually, in LightGBM and XGBoost, it has to be twice differentiable, so you have to be able to calculate the gradient and the Hessian uh, because of the way the, the loss function is defined inside these two, these two implementations. But anyway, this is the way the gradient descent is performed. Um, on the other end, the evaluation metric is a different parameter that you can use. I used it uh, a lot in many Kaggle competitions, uh, and it defines uh, how the prediction is evaluated uh, on the validation set. Um, it can basically be any possible error function. It can be also a discrete error function. It does, doesn't have to be differentiable. Um, and it's very useful because when you have a specific metric in a Kaggle competition that is a strange metric, maybe discrete or not directly differentiable, you are typically forced to use a differentiable function as objective function, but you can then use, uh, any, you can then use this metric directly as evaluation metric. So the, gra the gradient boosting phase will be performed on another similar metric that is differentiable, but the evaluation of the validation set in order to find, for instance, the perfect uh, early stopping will be done uh, with the exact function that you are provided. And well, uh, this is some R code from uh, XGBoost. Uh, you can see the different way you, Im you implement a custom uh, objective function and a custom evaluation function. Uh, as you can see, when you, uh, this is the same, more or less the same also in LightGBM. Um, when you want to do a custom ob objective function, you have to manually calculate the gradient, grad, and the Hessian S, and uh, um, provide them to the algorithm. While when you want to use a custom evaluation function or evaluation metric, you just have to calculate uh, some kind of error function. Um, that is really not, not even dis differentiable, for instance. Um, and obviously, you can use them both when you do some kind of, uh, uh, when you have to solve some kind of problem. So you can use uh, a custom objective function and a custom evaluation metric, or just one of the two, whatever you, you like. Um, I'll do one step forward. What are the relevant parameters for gradient boosted trees? Um, well, there is a very large documentation on the parameters that you can tweak on XGBoost or LightGBM. I will leave you some links in the references. Uh, there are around 86 parameters. I was impressed by this number, but uh, I double-checked it. Uh, and uh, um, so you can really uh, tweak them extensively. Some parameters belong only to LightGBM or only to XGBoost, but most of them are present in both uh, implementations. Um, and as I told you, they can be divided into parameters related to the boosting process and parameters related to how trees are built, how trees are grown. Um, these are just some of the examples. Probably you know them all or already, but uh, I will not really go one by one into explaining uh, each of them, also because they are quite useful, uh, quite uh, you know, common. Um, my personal experience on these parameters is that these are usually all the parameters that you need to tweak. Um, there are many others, but they are not as useful. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, 
as, as long as you have uh, a serious cross-validation setup, you can really tweak in any possible way. You can do some Bayesian op optimization. You can do some regular grid search, depending on what time you have uh, uh, available and the size of your data set. But uh, I mean, it's much more important to have a serious cross-validation setup than to focus on some magical values of these, uh, of these parameters. Um, well, I wanted to show you, I, I'm not focusing on the differences between XGBoost and LightGBM, uh, also because after the introduction of LightGBM, uh, XGBoost really added some of the features that LightGBM originally implemented. Uh, so nowadays, uh, uh, some of the features that distinguish LightGBM from XGBoost have already been imported there. But let me just say, for instance, that uh, XGBoost is an algorithm that grows trees uh, depth-wide, or level-wise, uh, and uh, LightGBM, on the other end, uh, is an algorithm that grows trees in a much more greedy way, in a leaf-wise fashion. So this is related to how a single tree is built. Uh, LightGBM is much more greedy. It's in the, on the lower part of the slide, if it, even if it's not, uh, not written. And this is one of the differences, just to, just to show you. Um, OK, I'd say uh, we can move on to, the, to another phase that is feature engineering for GBTs, for gradient boosted trees. Um, well, th the, first, the first important thing is uh, uh, categorical encoding. Uh, th that is one of the usually trickiest part on, uh, on any machine learning algorithm. Uh, I think you basically have six available options to do categorical, categorical encoding, and I will go through them one by one. Um, the first one is native encoding. So there are some algorithms like CatBoost and LightGBM for sure. I'm not sure about the latest releases of XGBoost, um, but some, uh, at least CatBoost and LightGBM natively support uh, uh, categorical features. So you don't have to worry about encoding categorical features in some specific ways, and you can just use them uh, as they are provided. Um, so it's quite easy, quite, quite an easy approach. Uh, the second one is one-hot encoding. Uh, one-hot encoding uh, is the classic approach, classic statistical approach that is used also on uh, linear regression, uh, logistic regression, and so on. Uh, usually, this, this is definitely not the best thing to do when you use gradient boosting, um, because if you, it can be feasible if you have a really low le number of levels, but if you have many levels, uh, you end up with a much larger feature space, uh, and uh, it's really not, uh, not the best thing to do. Uh, on the other end, numeric encoding is very counterintuitive, uh, especially for uh, people that have a strong statistical background, uh, because numerical encoding means uh, encoding uh, like red, green, and blue as one, two, three. So it apparently makes really no sense. But uh, in gradient boosted trees, it's probably the best way to do encoding of categorical variables, because the boosting process really manages to catch these, uh, the differences between the, the different levels. Uh, and it's usually perfectly fine if you don't have uh, a really large number of, uh, of levels. Um, but there is another, another way that you can encode uh, uh, categorical values, variables, and it is binary encoding. Uh, it is not really widely used, but uh, uh, to me it's a very good uh, approach if you have a, a huge number of levels, like a thousand number of different levels. And the idea is that you perform numerical encoding of uh, this categorical variable, but then you encode them binarily, in, in a binary fashion, let's say. So if you have uh, 1,000 variables or 1,024, you just need 10, 10 levels, 10 binary zero ones, to encode uh, a categorical variable. And the last two are probably, um, you know, the smartest approaches, uh, if used carefully, uh, the first one is target encoding, uh, when you encode the variable, the, each level, based on, it, uh, on its uh, expected outcome. Uh, and it is uh, a very good approach, but you have to handle it with care, because uh, you're introducing a leak when you encode uh, a categorical variable with the expected outcome. Um, so you, mm, when, I, uh, when I've used ta target encoding in some Kaggle competitions, I always used it uh, out of sample. So I encode some variables in a, like in a cross-validation uh, fashion uh, based on the outcomes of some other folds. So I'm not really leaking information directly. And the other approach is frequency encoding, and it is uh, um, a very smart approach that you can use. Uh, and uh, um, 
you know, uh, frequency encoding means encoding a, cate a categorical variable based on the number of occurrences that it has on a data set. Uh, and the point is that if you think about how trees work, uh, in this way you are putting uh, rarest level on one side of the tree and most common levels on the other side of the tree. So it makes it uh, more easy for, the, for each uh, single predictor, each single tree, to separate uh, frequent values and uncommon val um, values. So these are the six different approaches that you can use uh, with uh, categorical variables. And uh, my suggestion is to try them all and maybe use them in uh, in a, in a stacking, uh, stacking fashion, um, especially with, with some exceptions. For instance, one out encoding that has to be used only when you have a really low number of, of levels. Um, handling missing values. Uh, well, uh, GBTs handle missing values natively, so you can just skip uh, the imputation of missing values. Uh, usually in uh, statistical classes, they teach you uh, that you can uh, use the median uh, to fill uh, uh, missing values, but uh, this is not really particularly useful when you do gradient boosting. Um, on the other hand, it can be useful to uh, substitute missing values with extremely high or extremely low values uh, according to the, to the feature range, because in this way, again, you are putting the missing values on one extreme of the tree, so it becomes easier for the tree to uh, for each tree in the boosting process uh, to put uh, missing values on one side or the other. So again, this can be used again in a stacking fa fashion. Um, it, can be, it can be very useful. I think, uh, anyway, the most important thing that you can do when you do gradient boosting uh, is trying to make some uh, uh, thoughts about row-wise operations, row-wise uh, uh, yeah, considerations. And, uh, um, the point is that gradient boosted trees, even if they are very performing, uh, they, can, they usually work uh, on rows one by one, uh, as any machine learning algorithm, so they cannot catch uh, interactions uh, row-wise, between rows. Um, and I will show you two examples from two competitions that I did on Kaggle. Um, the first one was the, the Bosch competition that uh, took place, I think, uh, two years ago, okay, two years ago, or maybe three years ago. Uh, and uh, here, the key feature was understanding if two consecutive rows uh, were identical. So you just had to introduce uh, some features, uh, that binary features, simple binary features, that represented if, if the following uh, record was the same or not. Uh, so this is a kind of feature that obviously a gradient boosted tree cannot uh, really uh, grasp, cannot really understand. So it's very, very important to calculate this kind of feature. And another example, a more recent one, was talking data, talking data competition uh, um, one year ago, more or less, uh, that was about these uh, infamous click farms when they, they produce fake clicks uh, on advertisement. Uh, and uh, here the, the um, let's say, magic feature was creating some lag and lead features. So uh, you had a timestamped log in this, uh, in this competition and you could uh, you know, calculate when the last click from a specific device was. So it was a kind of raw comparison. Uh, and it's uh, very useful to do this kind of uh, operations because they cannot be modeled directly by any machine learning algorithm and uh, gradient boosted trees as well. Some other examples. Uh, um, feature interactions, uh, obviously, uh, gradient uh, trees in general and gradient boosted trees uh, uh, even more are pretty good at modeling uh, interactions between features uh, because of the way they are built, they are grown. Uh, but in general, uh, if you know that some kind of relation, uh, I mean, if you realize that some kind of relation is useful, uh, for instance, the ratio between two variables, uh, um, it can be very useful in trees to implement uh, to manually explicit the, the ratio of the two, of the two features. Um, and uh, uh, so it's much more efficient to, to explicit this kind of, of, uh, of interactions. Uh, and again, you can also um, calculate, pre-calculate interactions between categorical features as well. Uh, this can be, can be useful. Uh, and the last but not least, feature selection. Uh, again, trees are, uh, you know, quite resistant to noise in general, but uh, uh, on some specific data set, it can be very useful to drop, uh, to drop completely some uh, noisy variables or some variables that are different from train and test set. Um, 
So uh, again, this has to be checked against, uh, against the specific problem you have, but in general, uh, you have to take into account the fact that for gradient boosted trees, uh, you have to do feature selection as well. Um, so let me move to, to the conclusion, then uh, let's leave some space for uh, some room for the Q&A. Um, I, I gave you not a mathematical explanation of gradient boosting, but we show, uh, I showed you an example of how boosting process is performed. Uh, and uh, um, I think that, first of all, gradient boosting are still nowadays the first thing that you have to try on tabular data uh, because of their performance, scalability, and so on. Um, and in general, even if uh, the implementations are quite complex, uh, I've not really gone into the details of the gradient of the actions, uh, calculation, and, and so on. But in general, the concept of fitting the residuals is really the key to any gradient boosting approach, uh, whether it is gradient boosting trees or something else. And it is really the reason why overfitting uh, uh, appears in gradient boosting. Uh, and, uh, mm, well, I think that the concept itself is pretty straightforward and. Uh, uh, I, show you, I showed you in the, in the example. Um, some of the key concepts of gradient boosting, like the difference between objective function and evaluation function, uh, they have to be properly understood because uh, not always you have a simple metric to optimize, like the mean square error, the AUC, the log loss, uh, and so on. So when you have this kind of simple metrics, you can just use the built-in implementation of uh, uh, objective function and evaluation metric, but if you have uh, a different problem, maybe a discrete metric, uh, you have to, to understand these two concepts uh, quite clearly and to, uh, to optimize them uh, uh, the way I showed you. And the uh, last consideration is that uh, um, classical statistic approaches, uh, when it comes to imputing missing values, uh, uh, when it comes to encoding categorical uh, variables, uh, they are really not the best way to deal with uh, um, to, to, let's say, to approach a data set when you use gradient boosting. So one out encoding is not the best solution usually. Um, filling the missing values with some kind of value, especially the median, is definitely not the best solution. So you have to adapt the pre-processing that you do on your data set to the single characteristic of the gradient boosting approach. So you have to do different pre-processing with respect to the, uh, to the machine learning algorithm that you want to use. Uh, and it is true also if you use deep learning frameworks, for instance, you have to do completely different pre-processing. Um, let me close with something inspirational because I read a nice sentence that uh, really fits this presentation because it was inspirational. It, w it is on gradient boosting and it was said by um, a Kaggle Grandmaster that uh, presented, I think, in uh, Kaggle Days San Francisco as well. He is Mike Kim. Uh, and they say that my only goal is to do gradient boosting over myself of yesterday and to repeat this all over again. I think uh, you understand now that it's all about fitting the residuals. Um, and anyway, I would just like to, to thank you for your attention and uh, Q&A time. Thank you, Alberto. So first, uh, I would like to ask you, since you are here, you are a grandmaster, and I think we all secretly would like to become grandmasters. So what would be your, your golden advice for us to, to become grandmasters? Oh, well, uh, it's, uh, I think it takes a lot of uh, time and <laughs> determination to get to grandmaster status. Uh, I think it, uh, I mean, it's quite easy in Kaggle to just have a look at some kernels that are uh, performing well and just try to mimic what this kernel uh, do. Uh, but I, um, I think that you have to focus a little bit on understanding some things like, uh, you know, uh, I showed you gradient boosted trees, uh, the gradient boosting phase and the tree phase. So understanding uh, a little bit of each algorithm, uh, it's crucial because you have to know what you are doing. So when you do some pre-processing, uh, you have to do it uh, understanding at least the basics of, uh, of the algorithm itself. So, um, I'm a very practical guy, I'm not a theoretical guy, but uh, I think that uh, you have to, to have a basic understanding of, uh, of algorithms, and not only to try libraries and uh, to op optimize parameters uh, uh, as a machine, let's say. Understood, thank you. So, questions? By the way, you can ask the question in English, or I think even in Spanish we can speak. Yes, um, if, if you speak in Spanish, just speak slowly. <laughs> Okay, hello, thank you for the talk. I want to ask you, because I didn't get one point, when you were talking about the 
target encoding, mm -hmm. just, uh, in, it seems to me that you can only apply that when you are stacking models, but maybe I'm wrong. And I want uh, you to comment. Sorry, it seems to you that you can to apply To me that you can only apply that when you are stacking, but maybe no. I'm wrong. No, you it's can not comment on that. Okay, I, I'll explain this point more, uh, more clearly. Um, okay, it's point number five. Uh, target encoding, okay, it means uh, to encode a specific level with uh, um, the average outcome of this level. So if you do it uh, in a naive way, you end up encoding, you end up leaking information because uh, obviously uh, you are using the target to encode the variable, and so it's not, uh, it's not really a smart way. You are introducing a leak. Um, you can do it out of sample, and yes, you can see it uh, partially as a kind of stacking, but uh, it's more, um, let's say, more like cross-validation. So um, le let's imagine you have a, um, a data set uh, you divide it uh, in five folds, and you encode the first fold, um, the, the, fir the levels present in the first fold, with the average outcome present in the other four folds. So you are not leaking information directly. Uh, I'm not sure I, I answered your question, but yeah, yeah, yeah. thank okay. you. Okay. Ah, okay. Hi, Alberto. Hi. Uh, my question is. Uh, what is a typical termination condition? So you just stop when the evaluation function stops improving, or there are more tricky ones? Uh, uh, can, you, can you repeat the, the question? Sorry. So for the iteration of building okay. newer and newer trees with the residuals, mm -hmm. at one point you will stop. Yes, and I see okay. this is automatic. What are typical strategies? Uh, I, I think that uh, my personal strategy is that, okay, you perform cross-validation over, uh, let's say, five folds. Uh, and, uh, okay, uh, if you have a standard uh, um, evaluation metric or even a custom evaluation metric at some point in time, you will see that the error starts increasing in, in the validation uh, uh, fold. Uh, the point is that uh, usually in XGBoost and XGBM, after you have seen that the optimal uh, number of trees is uh, a given number, you are retraining on all the data set. So uh, when you do Five-fold cross-validation, actually, you are training on 80% of the data set in a rolling fashion. Uh, but finally, you train on 100% of the data set. So you, has, you usually have to adjust the number of iterations. So I typically multiply the optimal number of iterations by a small factor that is like, in order to, uh, you know, to take into account that uh, the cross-validation is done 80-20, okay? So it's trained on 8 and validation on 20, but finally, I retrain on 100. So I typically multiply by 1.25, 1.25, the number of the iteration. But there is no really golden, golden rule. Um, so it's uh, quite tricky. You can also use the feedback that you have from the, the public leaderboard with caution, let's say. But uh, it's also a thing that you have to do. OK, thank you. There was, Fernando, there was one over there. Yeah. Yeah, I, w I would like to, to talk some more about the interpretability of uh, gradient ah. boosting. Uh, do we compromise the model when we apply uh, monotonic constraints? Mm -hmm. Or could, we, yeah. um, could you sure. explain uh, a little bit the yeah, deeper in, in that stuff? Uh, Is there any other way uh, to explain the, the model? Besides uh, future importance, perhaps? Thank yes, uh, absolutely. I, I think, uh, um, uh, let me see. OK, it was this slide. Uh, I will give you a, a quick answer, then I will. Uh, li uh, I talked about it, this topic exactly <laughs> in Paris, and it was a 40 minute talk focused oh. on explainability, so I will try to squeeze the information. Um, you can do basically a, a few things with, uh, with trees, and it works really perfectly from my point of view. Uh, you can do monotonic constraints. Uh, that is something you do before building the model. Uh, so um, uh, you enforce the tree to be grown uh, in an ascending or descending way. And this, uh, this is a very smart way to, to approach a problem, because in some situation, uh, uh, when you have to explain a model, you want uh, absolutely to have a monotonic behavior. Yeah. So like the example of the uh, surface of the square and the rental price. If you have a larger uh, apartment in the same place, uh, same country, same city, uh, in the end, a larger apartment is going to cost at least as much as a smaller apartment. Okay? So this is an example of a monotonic constraint that you enforce when you build the model. 
So in this way, the trees are never grown uh, in the other. If you fix um, an ascending constraint, every tree is not descending on that feature. And so it, this is something you do before building the model. Um, on the other hand, uh, I suggest you to check out uh, Lyme and Shapley that are uh, two different approaches to um, interpretability. Uh, well, they can be applied also not only to gradient-boosted trees, but uh, there are some really nice implementations for XGBoost and LightGBM. Uh, for instance, Shapley uses game theory uh, to, in order to explain the importance of each variable for a specific record that you score. So, um, let, let's say you can have two records, uh, you want to predict some, some kind of measure, two, two houses, for instance, two apartments, and they have the same uh, estimated target uh, rental price, okay? But it can be for different reasons. So, with Shapley and also with Lime, you can say that uh, uh, the two apartments that cost the same, according to the model, are influenced by different factors. Maybe one is smaller, but it's in a more expensive uh, place, I don't know. So this is, uh, this is what I call local interpretability. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is also global interpretability that is for sure feature importance, okay, but it's not really, it just shows what are the most important, most frequent uh, features in your model, but also PDPs that are partial dependency plots uh, that shows you um, uh, how the target, the target prediction is influenced by one or two variables. Yeah. Um, so they are really different. You have uh, uh, monotonic constraints first, you have PDP uh, globally, and then you have uh, Lyman Shapley locally. It's a super interesting topic. Uh, um, and uh, another point that you ask in your question, yeah. the point is that uh, monotonic constraint influence the way, mo the way uh, models are built. Mm -hmm. So I also tried monotonic constraints in a competition that was uh, uh, about credit risk. Um, it was the, sec it's the second largest comp uh, I cannot home remember the name. Huh? The home credit default K KL competition? Mm, no, it, was, uh, it had like 7,000 participants. I cannot remember. It was last year in summer. Oh. Um, uh, anyway, uh, in that competition, I thought about using monotonic constraints. I tried them, and they didn't really work very well from a performance point of view. Um, so it's a trade-off. Maybe when you work, you have to enforce these kind of constraints, uh, but you lose something in performance. But they also have a regu regularizing effect. So they ca you can also have a better performance with monotonic constraints. It really depends on the data set. And uh, on the other end, Lime, Shapley, PDPs, they are built after the model, so they do not influence at all the way the, mo the model is built. So they come for free. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I suggest you to try, to try them out. Thank you. So, more questions? Uh, hello, uh, it's about the numerical encoding that you said. Uh, I can understand that even being numerical, uh, it's okay uh, for a tree-based model, mm -hmm. because after all, it's uh, binary questions and okay. But XGBoost also has a regression part. Do you have any explanation why this regression part is not affected by this numerical encoding? If I have any, any explanation why uh, regressions are not affected by... Indeed, yes. Well, I, I think it's really... Okay, you're referring to this, to this one. Um, it doesn't really change a lot if you have a binary classification or a regression or a multi-class classification because um, if you think about the way trees are built uh, and uh, if you think about the um, boosting process that keeps on building trees on the residuals, you will see that... Uh, if you have a limited number of residuals, uh, um, I mean, you will be able to segment the feature space in quite an effective way. Also because, uh, uh, actually, uh, with XGBoost or LightGBM, you do not build really super weak trees, let's say. You build trees that are maybe, that have six, seven, eight levels of depth often, or maybe also a hundred of, uh, of, leaf, of leaves. So, uh, it's really not, uh, not particularly related to the kind of target that you have, in my opinion. It's uh, the way trees are uh, segmented uh, iteratively. So, um, yeah, that, that's my point of view. Okay, thanks. More questions? Yep. Okay, maybe it's a beginner question, but how do you parallelize a bugging algorithm? How do you? 
parallelize. Oh, wow, this is not a beginner question. <laughs> no, uh, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, um, this is uh, one of the greatest things that uh, uh, Tianqui Chen brought to XGBoost implementation back in 2014, because when, uh, when you build a random forest, it's very natural to parallelize, because you build, uh, 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 let's say, you build uh, trees independently. While uh, uh, XGBoost does some kind of parallelization at three level, at inside each iteration. So uh, I'm not really an expert on this topic. I think it's a very technical uh, aspect of implementation. But uh, uh, there have been some interesting benchmarks that show that uh, uh, different, uh, when you build a, um, a random forest, uh, you could basically have as many parallel threads as the number of trees that you build. So if you build 10,000 uh, um, trees, uh, you can have 10,000 threads, 10,000 cores, for instance. Uh, on the other end, in LightGBM and XGBoost, they differ quite a bit one from the other. In general, uh, LightGBM is a little bit more uh, uh, multi-threaded friendly, let's say, uh, but they have a plateau. They, they do not scale indefinitely. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's a really... Mm, uh, it's really uh, an optimization that is done inside of each iteration. So it's not done at the boosting process, but it's done inside the, the iteration. Uh, that's that's my, my point of view on the topic. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yeah, you, you can pass it over there. Okay, thank you. So for you, uh, what would be the key considerations to be taken into account while working with gradient boosting on time series? Uh, sorry, what are the, uh, the key considerations you have to, to consider when working with gradient boosting on time series? Well, this is a wide topic. Uh, it's a topic that I like also because uh, I told you that <laughs> I won a prize last year in a master's only competition and it was actually, uh, let's say, not really a time series, but it was a time variant competition. So you had the, uh, yes, more or less a time series. Um, uh, so it's, uh, you know, you had 12 months of data and you had to estimate the following four months. So it was more or less a, a time series. Uh, you have to be um, very careful when you feed the data to, uh, w when you design actually the, um, uh, the, your cross-validation scheme with gradient boosted trees. Uh, but it's quite a not, not trivial topic to, not trivial question to, to answer in a, few, in a few moments. But uh, let me just say that you have to be sure that when you, uh, when you try to uh, predict a month in the future and you have uh, the, past, uh, uh, the past N months, for instance, the past 12 months, uh, you have to be sure to provide the algorithm some uh, um, coherent data. So, um, not, not easy, not, not really, I cannot give you a guideline that is, uh, you know, that you can use every day on gradient boosted trees. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I put it in this way. When you work with non-variant problem, non-time variant problem, doing cross-validation is usually pretty easy because you just perform n-fold cross-validation and you're done. Uh, when you work with time-based uh, problems, uh, this is really the thing you have to study, how to do proper cross-validation. Much more important than doing hyperparameter tuning. And uh, yes, that's, this is what matters. Thank you. Okay, so we're out of time. Thank you very much, Alberto. Thank you.